This week we are headed to fish with an old friend of mine and uh, in the shallow water fishing arena, a legendary personality. Now that word gets thrown around a lot, but it is very fitting for my friend, Mr. Flip Power. Kind of glad we're not fishing today, Flip. How you been? Good, man. Looks Good. like you, looks like you're getting ready to fire some breakfast up or something. You look like you brought an appetite with you. Uh, I br not only brought my appetite, I brought the appetite of two young guys too. What are we making? Looks like maybe French toast. Mims toast. Mims toast. Mims toast. And when I get to know you better, yeah, I'll give you the recipe. <laughs> Mims toast is something that I just made up. Mims toast does not really exist, so don't look for the recipe online. It's not there. It's really just another version of French toast, and we started making it years ago in my backyard or my garage on Saturday and Sunday mornings when all the guys would get together and come over during the winter and we'd cook out in the backyard and, and sit around and tell lies about airboats and hunting and fishing. And so Mim's toast just sort of evolved and it is a little bit different. There are zones on these fire discs that you, you really have to understand where the heat is to make them super effective. I, I see how you're laying this up on the sides. I use, I, on this, I, I lay it up on the sides and um, then I keep lubricating by throwing it out of the middle. Mm -hmm. But if I try to oh, cook... Oh man, that smells good. It almost smells like you're baking something. It's amazing, isn't it? It smells good. <laughs> it's amazing what some sugar and some cream will do to, to white bread, huh? <laughs> it's it's um you can almost smell it caramelizing this comes with a guarantee actually hopefully it's a guarantee of us catching some baby tarp <laughs> when we arrived at at flips um casa if you will he's got a great little outdoor shop and uh and he's got his hunting camping trailer there with all the things that you would expect someone like flip to have uh, the attitude as well. And he wanted to whip us up, both myself, him, and the camera team, some Mims toast, which is really just a variant of French toast. But I gotta admit, Mims toast sounds a hell of a lot better than French toast. Uh, it's got a little rum in it, it's got a little vanilla in it. it. It tastes great. And he did a fantastic job on the fire disc. Does Mims Toast even require you to use syrup? Yes. It does, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's decadent, but. Yeah, when you spend time with Flip, it's, it's definitely like being with someone you've known for a long time. And when he set aside this guava foot for me, this guava branch that he had cured and prepared uh, prior to this trip because we wanted to make that part of this show, and in turn, it really came out to be the most important part of our whole trip there was having something that Flip made and, uh, and now has sent off with me to do what I do and to keep the story going.
So breakfast was pretty amazing and fast. So what are we off to now? It looks like we were gonna make up a... All right, so last year when you started talking about guava forks for your mm -hmm. pole, I cut this out of the woods thinking that one day it would happen. So today's the day. This is your your fork. It doesn't look like much right now, but this is where the magic happens. I mean, see these tines are different sizes. <clears throat> so what I always do when I start is I start on the bigger tine mm -hmm. to bring it down to this size and it give just, it some uniformity. Yeah. So the vise helps hold it steady, but this thing here is that, that thing looks like it will eat it up. You know, it's it's a slow process, but you don't want to go too fast because I'm trying to make this side <clears throat> exactly like the other side. So how long do you have to let this thing cure so that it doesn't fail you in the field? <clears throat> well, this one's been curing with the bark on it for a year. For and a year. I leave the bark on because the bark holds the limbs or the tines in place and keeps them from splitting during the curing process. <clears throat> so this thing's been waiting for you for a year. And, and for me to care for it, is there any conditioning? There's, there's nothing, no, no teak oil, no nothing that you need? Salt to, water. Just salt water? Well, salt hell, water I can do that. <laughs> I can do that daily. <laughs> salt water will really harden this. Really? So yeah, so this is gonna take, I mean, this is gonna take a little while, but, but once we'll, the bark is off, now see how fast it's going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the bark is that hard, crusty exterior, but once you get down into yeah, the wood... Yeah, now I'm in the wood and it's going. So <clears throat> this little stub is the part that goes into the push pole itself. And just from years of experience of doing mm -hmm. this with, with wooden forks, if this gets wet inside the push pole, it swells and mm -hmm. splits the end of the push pole. But if you drill it like Swiss cheese and then push epoxy into, into all these holes, the epoxy holds it together. Holds it together to keep it from spreading and cracking your push pole. So I make a several of these holes. That's probably enough. And it just forms little <clears throat> epoxy girders uh, in that Almost part. Almost like the... rebar. <laughs> exactly, exactly like <laughs> rebar. Like That's rebar. exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. And it really does make a difference. But if you just put that in there, you're going to have a split push pole. Yeah. All right, let's go put it in the pole. All right, let's do it. Okay, make sure we don't All hit right. anything. We're good right here. Just lay it over right, that right way. Right there? Yeah, probably like that. Perfect. This will hurt. Yeah, I, I feel I'm welling up right now. This will hurt. <laughs> it won't hurt for long, <laughs> but it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. He came out with a, with Bathia lithium battery powered chainsaw. And when it touched that carbon fiber pole, it just, well, it turned, it, it turned out bad. It really did. Yeah, that's nasty. That's, that didn't work at all. I was like, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> but he saved it. He was able to go in there, find a fine tooth hacksaw, and he cleaned it right off. We have to really um, rough up the inside of the pole so the epoxy has something to, to grab, grab to. Yeah. And then the bigger, the bigger thing is after we do this, wash it out so that the dust mm -hmm. of this graphite is not in there or or it'll it, never it stick. Won't yeah it won't bond right, i'm gonna go get some acetone to clean this out okay if you wouldn't mind just keep keep doing it rasping the inside of that only about this far in yeah i'm thinking i'm going to be very attached to this guava root but there's probably some very spiritual significance. Not only is it gonna give me the advantage of being quieter. I think we're good. 
but it's <coughs> going to give me more of a, I guess, one with the earth feel. It does. I mean, <laughs> you're not going to be touching the earth with plastic anymore. You'll see, when I pull this out, you'll see all the dust. Oh, shit. It's like cleaning a, a rifle barrel. Yeah. Very after, good. After, after, you, after you run a lot of rounds through it. That's a good analogy. I mean, that is a very good analogy. <clears throat> and what I do is, just like a rifle barrel, I do this until I pull it out clean. Mm -hmm. And then I know I'm going to get a good bond. Yeah, perfect. All right, now, this is kind of cool. Take another piece of paper towel. Mm -hmm. I think I know what you're going to do here. No, you don't. You're not going to create a dam in here? Yes, you yeah. do. I told you, I've been repairing these things for a little while now. <laughs> so, okay, so we make a dam and we don't want it to go any further than the, than, than the actual end of the fork throat. Nice. Very nice. Pretty cool. He went thoroughly through how you attach uh, the natural guava foot to your push pole and then allow it to cure and set up. And my camera team, uh, Cam and Jack, they thoroughly enjoyed the whole moment uh, of him going from A to Z with this process. And they learned a lot. Now, if you can find a place to stand it up in that tree, in that elm over that there or something. Fork or something. Yeah, just stand the fork up so that anywhere. This is a perfect little spot for it right here. When you have someone like Flipster with you and you lay out these grand plans to do something special, something different, something that's going to make an impact and it never works out. I mean never works out. We're, we always end up in on plan B, if you will, and that typically ends up with him and I fishing in a friggin ditch. We had been trying to get this episode done with Flip for a while. Finally, we decided we're gonna do it, and it was all about catching some micro tarpon. That's what we wanted to do. And we got back in there, and we started seeing the little guppying and blurping of small micro poons. No luck. I mean, they weren't having any of it. They, we changed flies, we changed fly colors, we changed fly sizes. We used Ned rigs, we used everything, and these tarpon were not going to have it on that particular day as the front was coming in. Just, as always, you gotta adjust. The ditch, which was plan B, and I can't tell you, B felt like Z, I mean like that, because the idea was to be in the ditch to still have a shot at catching these landlocked tarpon that was in a totally different area code. I'm talking we drove 40 minutes to this spot. What are the chances that the tarpon in the spot that we were going to, the plan B spot, were gonna behave exactly like the ones in the plan A spot? I'd say when Flip and I are together, a pretty, a pretty good chance. So, what did we do? Like we always do, we ended up bass fishing. The day we, we always end up in a ditch, you and me. <laughs> always in a ditch. How is that possible? <laughs> it just seems like it always, we end up somewhere fishing like this. That's a nice bass, man. Nice bass. That's a hell of a bass. <laughs> oh a my good goodness, bass. my goodness, my goodness. <laughs> Persistence wears out resistance, my friend. I'm going to tell you what, that is a major bass. Especially in a little body of water like this. Son of a gun. 
Here, don't let him disrespect you. Oh, man. Now I gotta find a flat spot in the bank to go down and get him. I think right there, right there. Yeah, See might the depression the, right there? Hold the rod and I'll jump down there and get him. Man, you did that like a great blue heron. I know. CR, that is a swell fish. Good Lord. That's a bass. <laughs> Man, ditch fishing. You are so, look at how happy you are. Uh, well, this is the epitome of a ditch pickle right here. That, that is a nice bass. Look how happy you are. All right. I needed that. I needed that for my own, for my own, you know, laughter. All right, Flip, I'm gonna let this one go. Like Bill Dance did it. That might be pretty good, actually. <laughs> that might have turned out all right. There he goes. Oh, well, if I could just blind cast that, if I would have known that, I would have put a paddle tail on a half an hour ago. You are the man. Oh, shit. Persistence, persistence, persistence. There we go, another bass. You're just pulling them out of there. That, my friend, is a good one. I might get down there well, you got him up. Let me get down there and try to get him. <laughs> try to find us a spot to get down and get him. Here's a place right here. You see it? Is there a spot there? Yeah, there's a good spot right here. Let me set this down. <clears throat> All right, can we go home now? Woo! Are you tired of Tom Sawyer Huck Finn time? That is a respectable bass. I say yes. I say it's time for some more Mims toast or something. That's a beautiful fish. Thank you for the assist. Boy, you scurried down there like uh, Nuriev. If any of the people watching this know who Nuriev is, I'm going to be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Nobody's going to know who Nuriev is. Uh, somehow. CA and I always pull the rabbit out of the hat. Uh, those last minute fish, the sun is sinking, beating the water to death and struggling. Uh, I was actually ready to slip my wrists. Um, and then he put on a little paddle tail lure for me and lo and behold, I caught a bass. It's only a small bass, a little bass about this big. But, you know, we had a couple of bass under our belts, as we always do. Thanks, CA. Looking forward to the next ditch. Well, if you've been paying attention, you realize that this episode had nothing to do with catching fish at all. Hopefully you still enjoyed it. For those of you curious to know what piece of technology I finally shared with, with Flip for him to catch some fish, it was just this simple light action Zodius rod. It's a little six foot eight rod from Shimano. And this is the little Vanford 2000. Uh, I've got that packed with six pound Power Pro Super Slick V2 and the little swim bait that we are using on a chin locks hooks is just this little Slim Swims in the smelt color. And this is a 1 12th of an ounce chin locks. This simple setup is what allowed, well, Flip and I to have a Tom Sawyer Huck Finn moment. Now, if you'll take a second, let me show you that guava foot on the end of my push pole. In this episode, this piece right here, this guava foot that, that Flip created, cured, and attached to my $1,200 carbon marine <laughs> push pole is really what this was about. It was about the journey over there. It was about the journey of assembling this. And now I have that connection with Flip for forever, as long as I've, I own this push pole, which I will forever. And if I break it, I'll just cut it off and I'll put it in a shadow box and it'll sit in my studio. But the fact that for someone like Flip, who thinks like an old Seminole Indian that 
having something from Mother Earth, attaching once again you to Mother Earth as you push off the bottom and go on that angling adventure with Flip Pallet every time you push the boat off the trailer. That is what is priceless about this episode, is having the time and having him explain um, to not only me, but my son and Jack, how all this happens. It was about going over there and hanging out with an old friend, having him provide me with something that will remind me every time I'm pushing this boat that Flip Pallet is on board with me. Kind of talk a little about from your perspective, be, being excited for CA to come over and spend some time with you, have breakfast, get this guava foot that you've been waiting for a year to put on. Yeah, no, I mean, I wasn't excited. Okay, well, let's be clear. We could actually make plans to fish for amberjack and somehow we would wind up catching largemouth bass. You have to say action. Action. Before we do that, can we talk about, um, I don't know, Heather Locklear? I don't know who that is. You don't know who Heather Locklear is? <laughs> that's, how, that's how young he is. Go wait in the truck. <laughs> I mean, that was textbook right there. That was. That was textbook. What did the cowboy say at his second rodeo? I don't know. This ain't my first rodeo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what did he just say? <laughs> he said, what did the cowboy say at my second rodeo? I know what he said. <laughs> I didn't know you heard him. I thought you were going to die. <laughs>